Let's start with the universe. Do you ever think of the universe as a kind of machine that designs beautiful things at multiple scales? I, I do. Um, and I think of nature in that way in general, in the context of design specifically. I think of nature as everything that isn't anthropomass, everything that is not produced by humankind. The birds and the rocks and everything in between, fungi, elephants, whales. Do you think there's an intricate ways in which there's a connection between humans and nature? Yes, and we're looking for it. I think that from, let's say, from the beginning of mankind, uh, going back 200,000 years, the products that we have designed have separated us from nature. And it's ironic that the things that we designed and produced as humankind, those are exactly the things that separated us. Before that, we were we were to totally and complete, completely connected. And I want to return to that world. But bring the tools of engineering and computation to it. Yes, yes. I absolutely believe that there is so much to nature that, that we still have not leveraged and we still have not understood and we still haven't. And so much of our work is design, but a lot of it is science, is unveiling and, um, and, and finding new truths about the natural world that we were not aware of before. Everybody talks about intelligence these days, but I like to think that nature has a kind of wisdom that exists beyond intelligence or above intelligence. Um, and it's that wisdom that we're trying to tap into through technology. If you think about humans versus nature, at least in the realm, at least in the context of definition of nature is everything but um, anthropomass. And I'm using Ron Milo, who is an incredible professor from the Weizmann Institute, who came up with this definition of anthropomass in 2020, uh, when he identified that 2020 was the crossover year when anthropomass exceeded biomass on the planet. So all of the uh, design goods that we have created and brought into the world now outweigh all of the biomass including, of course, all plastics and wearables building cities, but also asphalt and concrete all outweigh the scale of the biomass. And actually, that was a moment. You know how in life there are moments that <laughs> be a handful of moments that get you to course correct. And, and my it was a Zoom conversation with Ron, and that was a moment for me um, when I realized that that imbalance, oh, now we've superseded the biomass on the planet, where do we go from here? And you've heard the expression, more, more phones than bones, and the anthropomass, and the anthropocene, um, and, and the technosphere sort of outweighing the biosphere. Um, but now we are really trying to look at, is, is there a way in which all things technosphere are designed as if as if they are part of the biosphere, meaning if you could today grow instead of build everything and anything, if you could grow an iPhone, if you could grow a car, uh, what would that world look like um, where the Turing test for sort of this, this kind of, I call this material ecology approach, but this, this notion that everything material, everything that you design in the physical universe can be read, uh, and written to as, or thought of, or perceived of as nature grown. That's sort of the Turing test for, for the company, or at least that's how I started. I thought, well, grow everything. That's sort of the slogan. Let's grow everything. And if we grow everything, is there a world in which driving a car is better for nature than a world uh, in which there are no cars? Is there, is it possible that a world in which um, you build buildings in cities, um, that those buildings and cities actually augment and heal nature as opposed to their absence. Is there a world in which we now go back to that kind of synergy between nature and humans um, where you cannot separate between grown and made? And it doesn't even matter. Is there a good term for the intersection between biomass and anthropomass, like things that are grown? Yeah, so in 2005, I, I called this material ecology. I thought, well, what if all material, all things materials would be considered part of the ecology and would have an impact, a positive impact on the ecology? 
um, where we work together to help each other, all things nature, all things human. And again, you can say that that wisdom in nature exists in fungi. Many mushroom lovers always contest my thesis here and saying, well, we have the mushroom um, network and we have the mother trees and they're all connected. Mm -hmm. and, and why don't we just simply hack into, in, into mushrooms? Well, first of all, yes, they're connected, but that network stops when there is a physical gap. That network does not necessarily enable the, um, the whales in the, in the Dominican to connect with an olive tree in Israel, to connect with a weeping willow in Montana. And that's sort of a world that, that I'm dreaming about. What, what does it mean for nature to have access to the cloud? At the kind of bandwidth that we're talking about, sort of think Neuralink for nature. You know, since the um, first computer, uh, the, um, and you know this by heart probably better than I do, but we're both MIT lifers. Um, we today have computational power that is um, one trillion times the power that we had in, in, in those times. We have 26.5 trillion times the bandwidth and 11.5 quintillion uh, times the um, memory, which is incredible. So mm -hmm. humankind, since the, since the first computer, has approached and accessed such incredible bandwidth. And we're asking, well, what if nature had that bandwidth? So beyond genes and evolution, if there was a way to augment nature and allow it access to the world of bits, what does nature look like now? And can nature make decisions for herself uh, as opposed to being guided and guarded and abused by, by humankind? So nature has this inherent wisdom that you spoke to, but you're also referring to augmenting that inherent wisdom with uh, something like a large language model. Exactly. <laughs> so comp compress human knowledge, but also maintain whatever is that intricate wisdom that allows plants, bacteria, fungi to grow incredible things at arbitrary scales, yeah. adapting to whatever environment and just surviving and thriving no matter where, no matter how. Exactly. So I think of it as large molecule models. And those large molecule models, <laughs> well of course, um, large language models are based on the on, on Google and search engines and, and so on and so forth. And we don't have this data currently. And part of our mission is, is to do just that, mm -hmm. trying to uh, quantify and understand um, the language that exists across all kingdoms of life, across all five kingdoms of life. And if we can understand that language, is there a way for us to first make sense of it, find logic in it, and then generate certain computational tools that empower nature uh, to, to build better crops, to, to increase the level of bi biodiversity? In, in, in the company, we're constantly asking, what does nature want? Like, what, what does nature want from a compute view? If it knew it, what, what could aid it in whatever the heck it's wanting to do? Yeah, so we keep coming back to this, this answer of nature wants to increase information, um, but decrease entropy, right? Mm -hmm. So find order, but constantly increase the information scale. And, and, and this is true for what our work also tries to do because we're constantly trying to fight against the dimensional mismatch between things made and things grown, right? And, and as designers, we are educated to think in X, Y, and Z, and that's pretty much where architectural education ends and biological education begins. So in reducing that dimensional mismatch, we're missing out on opportunities to create things made as if grown. But in the natural environment, we're asking, can we provide uh, nature with these extra dimensions? And again, I, I'm not sure what nature wants, but I'm curious as to what happens when you provide these tools to the natural environments, obviously with responsibility, obviously with control, obviously with ethic, ethics and, and moral code. Um, but is there a world in which nature can help fix itself uh, using those tools? And by the way, we're talking about a company called Oxman. Yeah, uh, I'll just, just a few words about the team. Yeah, what kind of humans work at a place like this? They're trying to figure out what nature wants. You know, I think they're first like you. They're, they're humanists first. Um, they come from different disciplines and different disciplinary backgrounds. And just as an example, 
We have a brilliant designer who is just a mathematical genius and a computer scientist and a, a mechanical engineer who is trained um, as a synthetic biologist. And, um, and now we're hiring a microbiologist uh, and a chemist, um, architects, of course, and designers, uh, roboticists. Um, so it's really... Uh, it's Noah's Ark, right? Mm -hmm. Two of each. <laughs> and uh, always dancing between this line of the artificial, the synthetic, and the and the real. What's the term for? And the natural. Yeah, the built and the grown, nature and culture, yeah. um, technology and biology. But we're 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 constantly seeking to to ask how can we build, design, um, and deploy products in three scales: the molecular scale, which I briefly hinted to, um, and there. In the molecular scale, we're really looking to understand whether there is a universal language to nature mm -hmm. and what that language is, and then build build a tool that um, I think and dream of it is the iPhone for nature. If nature had an iPhone, mm -hmm. um, what would that iPhone look like? Does that mean uh, creating an interface? Yeah. between nature and the computational tools we have. Exactly. It goes back to that 11.5 quintillion times the bandwidth that, yeah. that humans have, have, have now arrived at and and giving that to, to nature and seeing what you know what, what happens there. Can animals actually use this interface to know that they need to run away from fire? Can plants use this interface to increase the rate of photosynthesis in the presence of a smoke cloud? Can they do this, quote unquote, automatically without a kind of a top-down, brute force, policy-based method that's authored and deployed by humans? And so this work really relates to that interface with the natural world. And then there's a second uh, area in the company which focuses on growing products. Mm -hmm. um, and here we're focusing on a single product that starts from CO2. Mm -hmm. um, it becomes a product, it's consumed, it's used, it's worn uh, by a human, and then it um, goes back to the soil and it grows an edible fruit plant. So we're talking about from CO2 to, to fruit. Yeah, it starts from CO2 and it ends with something that you can like literally eat. Yes. Um, so, so the world's first uh, entirely biodegradable, biocompatible, biorenewable product. That's grown. Yes either using plant matter or using bacteria. But we are really looking at um, carbon recycling technologies that start with methane or wastewater um, and end with this wonderful reincarnation of a, an, an, a thing that doesn't need to end up in a composting site, but can just be thrown into the ground and grow olive and find peace. And there's a lot of textile-based work out there that is focused on one single element in this long chain, like, oh, let's create, um, you know, leather out of mycelium or, or let's create textile out of cellulose. But then it stops there and you get to assembling the shoe or the wearable and you, and you, you need a little bit of glue and you need a little bit of this material and a little bit of that material to, uh, to make it water resistant and then it's over. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that we're trying to solve for is how to create a product that is materially, computationally, robotically novel um, and goes through all of these phases from the creation, from this carbon recycling technology to, um, to the product, to literally how do you think about, you know, reinventing an industry that is focused on assembly and putting things together and using humans to do that. Um, can that, you know, can that happen just using robots and microbes and that's it. And doing it end to end. I would love to see what this it looks factory cool. looks like. <laughs> and the factory is, is great too. I, I'm, I'm very, very excited. In October, we'll, we'll share first, um, first renditions of, of, <laughs> of some of this work. And in February, we'll, we'll invite you to the lab. I'm there. <laughs>